Welcome, everyone, to Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you will find stimulating conversations about topics and stories affecting our communities. I'm your host, Sasha Fu. I'm pleased to welcome to today's podcast, Stephanie Drenka. She is a woman, a young woman who is unafraid to share her thoughts and speak her mind. She's an Asian American writer, essayist, historian, and a self-described storyteller who's relating the experiences of people who have been historically marginalized and unheard. Stephanie is the co-founder of the Dallas Asian Historical Society, a Korean adoptee, and a coach and facilitator for the Op-Ed Project, which is helping to build the confidence and the voices of individuals who've lots to say in the public square, but haven't been either encouraged or welcomed to do that. Now, appropriately, since this podcast is titled Asian Pacific Voices, I'd like to start by asking Stephanie how she came to believe in the power of her own voice. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Sasha. Thanks so much. Uh, It was a very long journey before I, A, understood the power of my voice and B, understood that it mattered and that it had a place in the public sphere. I grew up as a Korean adoptee in a white family. And so I I felt from the early days that I didn't belong and that uh, there were very few people who could relate to what I experienced. And my voice was kept in a journal. So I would write a lot um, in a diary. And when technology started to evolve, I started to use different online platforms to document how I was feeling because I couldn't express it outwardly. Um, I don't think it was until I went to college and started taking Asian American studies classes and learning more about the history of my community and understanding where I fit in in the bigger picture that I even understood how my story um, made sense with the rest of the world. And it wasn't until probably in the last five years that I gained the confidence to share my voice in a real way on issues that um, used to scare me before because I finally understood the the weight of, of my story and how it could impact people. I have a great deal of admiration for you, Stephanie, because it takes a certain amount of courage and bravery to, I guess, expose yourself in the public square and say, this is what I believe. These are my convictions. Because as you know, in social media, there are any number of people who are so willing to want to attack people for their beliefs or just pile on and say the most rude and kind of insensitive stuff. That said, how do you ignore the people who are kind of um, averse to what you want to say? And how do you construct a dialogue with them? Or do maybe you don't have a dialogue with them. <laughs> so sometimes I do have a dialogue with them. I'm pretty good at monitoring my capacity to engage in those conversations based on what's going on in the world, what's going on in my personal life. And sometimes I will try to connect. Um, But when I do have those conversations with people that have opposite viewpoints um, publicly, I don't necessarily think of it as the goal of trying to change their mind, but let other people see what kinds of vitriolic comments and feedback that people get and um, have them understand that Uh, There are people willing to be courageous and say things that matter and put themselves out there and hopefully inspire someone else um, to maybe do the same. Um, That being said, I I do understand that there's certain opinions that are really harmful and painful and not necessarily um, worth my time. What I learned through going through the op-ed project was that um, you really have to understand why you do what you do. And when they ask me that question, why do I do what I do? What legacy do I want to leave? What do I want my work to say about me? Um, my answer boiled down to one sentence was because it matters to someone. And I think back on what I needed or who I needed, what I needed to hear when I was growing up as a high schooler in South Lake, Texas, feeling like I was the only one. And so if my message happens to just reach the one person who needs to hear it at that moment and doesn't change, you know, millions of minds, that's okay because it it matters to one person at least. It matters to one person. That is profound. And I like to hear that. We'll dive into the op-ed project a little later, but I do want to ask you about growing up in a white family, mostly white community, as a Korean adoptee. Tell me a little bit about that experience and and why you decided at some point 
that it was very important for you to seek out your birth family in Korea? My parents grew up in Chicago. They were um, in a middle-class white family, Czech, um, as you can maybe tell by my last name. And I don't think they had to think about race very often. Um, They were in a pretty homogenous area when they were growing up. Um, And so adopting me, um, they saw me as theirs. They were essentially, as people like to say, colorblind. They didn't recognize that I was Asian. They um, really wanted me to assimilate into the family and be uh, feel like I belonged and that I wasn't othered, which to their credit, that is what adoption agencies at the time were really saying, you know, you know, make sure they feel like they're not like singled out. Um, and I don't think it was until we moved to South Lake, Texas, that I really started feeling um, the difference. So I grew up in Georgia um, until I was 10. And at that young age, I don't think we maybe recognize or internalize microaggressions or racism. But then when I moved to South Lake, it was my formative years. And um, I would get comments like go back to China, or at least, at least I'm American, implying that I wasn't. I had a teacher call me yellow and tell me that I needed to wear um, fake eyelashes on stage. I was in theater and he told me I needed to wear fake eyelashes so that my eyes would look open on stage. And the hardest the hardest part was not feeling like I could go home and tell my parents what I was experiencing because adoptees are told that we should be grateful, that we were saved essentially, that our adoptive parents gave us a better life and that we're lucky. And so anything that deviates from that narrative is um, we're taught that it's some sort of betrayal. So I kept it inside. I internalized it. I struggled um, with a lot of um, depression and um, low self-esteem as many young, you know, women and young Asian women do. And um, I would, I'm assuming at the time there weren't any confidants for you, right? There weren't any teachers or other kids in the school who could relate to your experience. Right. So I that was one of the earliest times that I turned to the internet. So um, I graduated from high school in 2004. So it was sort of the time when AOL was around. People were starting to make personal websites. I started to write down my thoughts and Um, taught myself how to design websites and had sort of an online blog that before blogs were were what they are now. Um, And so it it led me to go into communication. So I realized that I didn't necessarily have a future career in musical theater because at the time there were so few roles for Asian American women, but I loved writing. I loved speaking. And so I thought maybe broadcast journalism would be a good option. And I chose to go to DePaul University in Chicago. Um, And so I I studied communications there. But what sparked the journey to find my birth family started with um, getting involved with activism for the first time with the Korean American community. So I was invited to be part of a coalition of Um, Korean Americans and other activists who were advocating for the passage of House Resolution 121 um, in 2007-2008, which was um, unofficially known as the Comfort Women Resolution. And it was calling upon the Japanese government to make a formal apology for the sexual enslavement of women and girls during World War II. Um, Through my work there, I was invited to go to Korea for the first time um, by the Korean government for their future leaders conference. Um, So it was my first time going back to Korea since I was an infant. I went by myself, essentially. I met a group of conference people and my friends once I got there, but I was traveling without my family. And I decided to go to my birth, um, not my adoption agency, and just see the baby's home, um, to see where I started, have some sort of answers to where I came from. And they asked me when I told them I was coming if I wanted to start a search for my birth family. And I said I didn't know. I had to think about it. Um, It wasn't something that I had ever thought or planned to do because my adoptive parents were told sort of the same story I think a lot of us are told that 
Um, my birth mother was a single mother and she, you know, she uh, may not have told her, you know, she may have gotten remarried and not told her family about me and it could be, you know, bringing shame. So I went to the adoption agency thinking I wasn't going to start a birth search, but she went through my file with me. And the first thing she told me was that she had looked at my birth father um, and he had passed away four years prior. Um, and then uh, she told me that I had two older sisters. And that was the first time I was hearing that information. And she said, they might not know you exist. They might have been too young. Um, and it was at that point that I decided I needed to find them. Do you remember your emotional response when you heard that you actually had two sisters? I remember everything being very overwhelming because I had just found out that my birth father had passed away. Um, somebody that uh, I had a lot of questions about. And now I had, I was sort of that choice or that chance to meet him or ask him questions was um, removed. And then when I found out that I had sisters, I felt really betrayed by the adoption agency because it was really clear that they had that information from the time I was born and kept it from me. And I probably would have started searching earlier. Um, and then it was a question of, do they know about me? Do they miss me? And all the typical questions adoptees think about when they start a search, who do I look like? Like, where do I fit in with this family? Um, why was I the one that was sent away? Um, and so a lot of a lot of questions and it was, you know, several years before I found them and lots of lots of emotions and roller coasters throughout that process. I really want to dive into the op ed project a little later, but I want to touch first on your decision at some point in your life more recently to actually spend a lot of effort in terms of reconnecting with your birth family in Korea. How did that journey begin? It was unplanned, I would say. It was something that I hadn't thought about doing initially. Uh, the information that my adoptive parents were given about my birth mother was that she was likely a single mother, may have been remarried since I was born and not told her new family about me, and I could be disruptive in some way if I was to look for her. Um, so out of respect to her and to my adoptive family, I sort of opted out of that. Uh, but then I had the opportunity to travel to Korea for the first time since I was an infant um, as part of a leadership conference that the Korean government um, offers for overseas Koreans. And so I was invited to attend uh, and, you know, take this incredible journey and this trip. And because I didn't know when I'd be back to Korea, I decided to visit my adoption agency while I was there. And I toured the the baby's room and got, you know, got to meet the staff and the, the founder of the adoption agency. And then at the end of my visit, the social worker told me she needed to go through my file with me, which um, was surprising to me because I already had all the paperwork, I thought, um, because my birth, my I knew my birth mother's name and I knew where um, she was born. I had a lot more information than most adoptees are given. But she went through the file and the first thing she told me was, oh, we looked up your birth father and he passed away um, in 2004. And this was 2008 that I was um, in Korea. So he had passed away four years prior. And I was still processing that information when she says, and you have two older sisters. And, um, you know, growing up as someone with a younger brother, having sisters was something I had dreamed about. I think most girls do. Um, and to then know that they had had this information the entire time since I was born and, and kept it from me, kept it from my adoptive family, um, felt like sort of a betrayal. And so immediately I told them, yes, I want to start this search uh, for my birth family because my birth mother is still alive, according to the records. And, you know, I've already lost the chance to meet my birth father and ask him questions and get answers. So I don't want to miss out on any more, more time. Through a lot of effort, you eventually were reunited with your birth mother and the sisters. Can you describe, you've written about this in your blog, but tell us a little bit about the emotional impact this had on you. 
I would say the search itself was very emotional. That um, that 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 uncertainty of um, if if you are going to find them, and then also having to manage um, my relationship with my adoptive parents, who especially my mom was very confused about me looking for my birth family and felt like it was some sort of indication that I was unhappy with them, which it was completely separate from my relationship with them. I just it was something that I felt I needed to do. But what was difficult was every time I would get an email from the adoption agency and they would tell me, well, we sent a telegram because they can only send a telegram that says, you know, someone born on this date is trying to get in touch with you. Please contact this number. And they will only send it um, at certain increments. So like every couple years, they would send a new telegram. They would let me know. We didn't hear. I, um, I tried to go on a Korean television show where you um, search for missing people and tell your story and that didn't lead to anything. And um, in 2014, I reached out again and the response I got back from the social worker was that this time they sent someone to the house directly to deliver the telegram and it looked like no one had lived there and this was probably the end of the road. But if I wanted to leave a letter and photos in case they looked for me later, I could. And so I, you know, that was a grieving process as well. I accepted that I tried my best to find them and it just wasn't going to happen. And then um, about a month later, I got an email in the middle of the night saying that, uh, good news. We have found your birth mother and your sisters and they're so excited to meet you. And they, <laughs> they sent, you know, a, a zip file of all these family photos. And I didn't even understand who was who. And there was like a young man in the, the photographs that I later found out was my younger brother because my birth parents were married. And after they relinquished me, had a son that they kept. And I got to fly to Korea shortly thereafter and meet them and spend time with them. I've been back um, a second time and I have um, one sister that has visited me in Texas. How does that affect your sense of self and your identity, the missing pieces that you felt when you were growing up? You told me that you weren't enough, you weren't American enough, you weren't Korean enough, you were stuck between these two worlds. Did meeting your birth family help give you a sense of more wholeness? Hmm. I I think meeting my my Korean family solidified that I will always be sort of in this in between space. Um, there's a lot of time that I missed out on with them that we can never get back. There's a language barrier that is very difficult to manage. Um, but I think I got more comfortable with my space in this in between. And understanding that what I saw as some sort of flaw or or weakness or challenge is actually what makes me uniquely positioned to share my story and to make a difference with what I've gone through. And um, I've learned to embrace it now. I think a lot of people who have been adopted and their birth families are in other countries have gone through some of the same soul searching about whether they really want to find the origin of where they came from or their family. And it is a difficult situation. It's a difficult decision to make, isn't it, Def Stephanie? Mm -hmm. It is. And there's a, um, for some people and some advice that I heard bef when I was younger, I think in my college days was that um, a lot of people go through the birth search hoping to get answers to questions but you just end up with more questions. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel. I got some questions answered, but there's so many things that I want to know that just for time's sake, I probably will never have the answers to. Um, what's really difficult is knowing what parts are my story now, because when I share stuff about my Korean family, there's still a lot of shame and stigma around the situation. Um, there are still family members that they haven't told about me or what happened. Um, and so it's just a, I don't think I, I, I saw finding them as the end, the ending, the resolution, but for them, it opened up old wounds. It um, reminds them of really painful memories of my birth father and what they experienced with him. 
And I've had this process to heal and I'm at a place now where I'm ready to share and, and, and move forward. And there's a lot of work that I. Well, you alluded to the fact that um, it was painful, particularly because of your birth father and his behavior. Can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Because I don't think our audience may fully understand that your mother gave you up for adoption or relinquished, but it wasn't necessarily her choice. Mm-hmm. It wasn't her so choice. So I, the do- it wasn't her choice. The adoption agency, the story that they tell is like, you know, your your birth mother gave you up because she wanted you to have a better life. Um, but what I learned meeting my Korean family was that my birth father um, was disinvested in the family. I would say he had a mistress that was living with him and he didn't want another daughter. And so when he found out that I was a girl, he set up all the paperwork, him and his mother Um, arranged for the adoption. He wasn't even at the hospital when I was born. The social worker just came and took me from my birth mother's arms. Um, And she told me in a letter after I found them that when I was born, she wanted to hold me until she died. And um, she had to give me up physically. And that pain and that trauma is something like she's still, it's very difficult to have conversations with her. She won't look me in the eye. She shakes and says, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to know that, um, she still carries so much guilt for something that was not, not her choice and not in her control. That is a powerful story. It's a sad one. It, it makes me feel terrible about her because she's still going soldiering through these years with this tremendous burden of shame and guilt. Um, Switching um, the topic a bit, I want to talk about your involvement with the Dallas Asian American Historical Center or Society. Um, Where did you get the inspiration to begin this search for archival material that relates to Asian Americans in in Dallas of all places. I mean, we think of New York or California, but Dallas. Yeah, I I think it all seems very random. Um, I was not a history major. This is not something that I grew up wanting to do. Um, but I do understand very clearly how um, painful or how difficult it is to know who you are if you don't have a connection to the past, if you don't have records of where you came from and who you're connected to. So in that sense, history has always been of interest to me. Um, but specifically in Dallas, I was working for a nonprofit uh, whose mission was based on a framework that in order to achieve racial equity, we had to um, change the narrative. And that meant telling untold stories, having a complete uh, recounting of history locally and nationally. And so I was doing a lot of work and research on the history of Dallas and realizing how little there was recorded about Asian Americans in general. And then, you know, as as we saw the rising anti-Asian hate crimes being reported specifically after the Atlanta area shootings, I was noticing patterns um, repeating from history, um, echoes of things that were said about Chinese immigrants in the 1800s being diseased, you know, carrying, you know, vile diseases being echoed um, about COVID and about our community now. And I was Um, noticing patterns between how Asian women were portrayed after the Atlanta area shootings and connecting it back to the 1875 Page Act, where Chinese um, immigrant women were seen as disease-carrying prostitutes and sexualized and um, objectified. And it was frustrating to me that locally people weren't making that connection, but I realized it was because they had no no concept of these histories because it's not taught in Texas high school curriculum. Um, There are very few Asian American studies programs in in Dallas, Fort Worth, in the area, and other organizations that were doing historic preservation work were forgetting about us. And um, I looked at first for other organizations that I could volunteer for or help, and locally there wasn't anything. And it was just sort of one day I woke up and realized no one else is going to be doing this. I might as well. I, I have the resources. I have the um, skill set of 
creating platforms, creating websites, building communities and researching and writing. I'm just going to do it. Well, you're starting from scratch, essentially, from ground zero. How do you go about finding the stories and the archival materials that you want to incorporate into this collection? Um, in a couple different different avenues, when I look for like the earliest records of Asians in Dallas, um, it's going back into old city directories, old newspaper archives. And what has been fascinating to me is the search terms that you have to use. You can't search for Asian American and you can't even search sometimes for Chinese or Chinese American and find the earliest records. You have to use words like Chinaman or celestial or Asiatic or all of the slurs that people use to describe us back then. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting, um, it's detective work essentially. Um, but the other part of our mission is to preserve the history that is happening right now. And so we're doing that through oral history interviews. We um, offer events where community members can bring their photos and their artifacts and their family history. And we help digitize it to add it to our collections and then help them um, preserve it and keep it in good condition for their own legacy as well. And then the biggest part is sharing that because history is only, you know, worth something when it's amplified and when it's activated. And so we use social media, we use the internet. Um, um, we're having our first event in July, our first exhibit to try to educate the public and fill in some of these gaps from what we're not taught in school. So you're talking about a, an exhibit. So I'm presuming you actually have a physical space for the historical society now. It's not just in a virtual space. So we operate virtually right now, remotely. We're um, working in partnership with a local organization called Preservation Dallas, and they have a physical location that they are um, partnering with us to set up our exhibit for, you know, the month of July. So we're really blessed to have that community partnership. And I'm glad you're finding allies too, right? You're you're getting support from other like-minded organizations that also want to preserve their bit of of a historical significance for their communities. What's been really heartwarming, I think, and just speaks to how much we've been erased and excluded in the past, is that a lot of our most like art and support has come from non-Asian Americans. It has come from other people who are just interested in history or other people who are interested in racial equity and have recognized that there's this huge missing chunk of the larger picture because we have been um, left out. And so they've been very, very supportive in terms of funding, in terms of offering space, offering um, just guidance in where we can look for some of these archival materials or um, letting us know that they have a friend who has a really important story and connecting us to people that we can interview. Yeah, I think it's so important to preserve the past because without the past, how do we understand who we are in the present and even marching into the future? Talking about the future, where do you see, explain for us a little bit about your work with the op-ed project. You are what's described as a facilitator and coach. I actually wasn't fam familiar with this organization at all, but now that I'm learning more about it, I'm I'm very impressed. I think there's definitely a role for this. Yeah, the Op-Ed Project was founded in 2008 by a woman named Katie Orenstein, and it was around the time when there were a lot of conversations about women and underrepresentation. It started with you know, someone from Harvard asking why there weren't more women in higher math and science, and could it be that women lack the biological aptitude? And some people were saying, you know, it's it's socialization. Women are socialized this way, and that happened in the op-ed pages too. Most of the opinion pieces. Um, written by experts and thought leaders in places like the Washington Post were predominantly men. Um, that year, 2008, nine out of 10 op-eds published by the Washington Post were written by men. But what they realized was that nine out of 10 people who pitched op-eds were also men. So <laughs> the, the, the amount of people pitching was the same as the amount that was being published. And so Katie wondered, what if we could get more smart women to pitch their op-eds and to pitch their ideas? And the op-ed is just 
sort of a, a measurement. It's something that's measurable to say, you know, this person put their idea on the world and had influence, but it's really just opening a door. It's one way to get an idea out, be seen as an expert, um, have that open the door for more opportunities. And the curriculum that the op-ed project um, teaches is less about op-ed writing or how to write. It's more about how to understand your expertise, how to view yourself as credible, especially your lived experiences, and how to th- speak to what you know really, really well and tie it to important topics that are happening in the news today and make yourself relevant and timely as well as knowledgeable. And going through one of their fellowships, I saw firsthand how impactful it was. And I had two essays published in HuffPost. I've had op-eds published in Newsweek, in locally in our Dallas Morning News. Um, one of my blog posts was um, quoted in the Washington Post. So I've seen it work. It has changed my life um, in ways that I can't even measure. And so now I have the privilege of facilitating their online workshops and and acting as a coach for other fellows um, at different institutions. When you started as a fellow, Stephanie, you came to it already knowing where your area of expertise or your voice of authority would come from because of your, your background as a Korean adoptee. That was the springboard for your op-eds or not when I applied for the fellowship. (laughs) Yeah. When I applied for the fellowship, I had no idea what I was going to write on. I didn't see myself as an expert. I just knew I loved writing. And so I saw it as like, oh, it's a writing fellowship. I didn't understand what op-eds were really. I didn't know even what I would write about. But during the very first session, they ask us to introduce ourselves and say what we are an expert at, that we are probably more of an expert than anyone else in the room. And I was in a room with executive directors, with PhDs, with CEOs, um, you know, all in the nonprofit space. And there was nothing that I thought I could say that I was more of an expert in than any of them, except... I am an expert in the transracial Korean adoptee experience because I've been an adoptee since I was born. And the reactions that everyone had, no one obviously could knock me off that pedestal. And I realized that that was my expertise. It it really is the foundation for everything that I do and why I do it and why not lean into that and, and embrace it. Yeah. I love that story because it, teaches us that, you know, the things that we don't necessarily value about ourselves are actually nuggets of gold to people. We may not even, we may not understand that about ourselves. Sometimes it takes somebody else to say, Hey, what about this? So I'm, I'm so glad that you're sharing your expertise and your lived experiences with us. You're really a great writer, a really a powerful communicator. And I've enjoyed uh, reading about your experiences I I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you coach somebody who is, I mean, it's often been said that Asian Americans are reticent about using their voices. It could be a cultural thing. It could be that um, for many of us who come from first generation families, we're told not to rock the boat. Don't be too loud. Don't say things that are going to draw attention. How do we counter this idea that we have to be quiet and uh, conforming to what other people say we should be? Yeah, I think it's uh, there. There's a fear that you have to overcome, and it's not so much um, fear in the traditional sense, like for your safety, or for sometimes it is depending on what you're saying, but. It's this fear of what other people will think of you, a fear of how people will receive your ideas, a fear that, you know, you'll look like you're bragging if you say that you're an expert in something or that someone will question your expertise. And so in the op-ed project, we have a saying that says, if you say things of consequence, there may be consequences. The alternative is to be inconsequential. And so whenever I am working with someone and they have all of these considerations and they have these fears and valid concerns about what might happen if they put their idea into the world, um, I remind them what will happen if you don't. What would happen if instead of telling your story, someone else tells your story for you and they twist it and they misrepresent it 
or they use it um, for something negative. That's not some that's not power that you want to give away. And so if you have a chance to tell your story in your words and own your expertise, I hope for the fellows that I coach that that outweighs the potential consequences. If you've been keeping track of the headlines recently, there's been a lot of attention on school communities where certain subjects can't be taught anymore. Um, fairly aggressive efforts to stop talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know these things are very important to you. If you were advising educators today about how we can raise a generation of anti-racist students, what are the one or two things that you think might make the most difference? Um, I'm very familiar with... um this effort to keep DEI out of schools because my high school uh, district, South Lake, was the subject of a podcast on specifically that topic. So it's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about advocating for. And when it comes down to it, um, to cultivate anti-racism in young people, um, there's, there's always going to be people who believe something so strongly and value something um, so um, in such a disciplined way that whatever facts they hear, they will choose to either take it in and keep it or throw it away and forget that they heard it if it doesn't match their value system. Um, but the, the way that you can combat that is through empathy and through respect. And I think the one most powerful tool we have in building empathy and cutting through um, some of those, that tunnel vision is through our stories. Stories make us human. Stories um, have patterns that people can recognize in themselves and their own experiences. And so if I were to talk to educators today who are um, having difficulty including certain facts or certain events in their curriculum, I would encourage them to teach their students that their voices matter and that their stories and their experiences are significant. And they need to be telling the stories to each other. They need to be listening to each other and finding common ground and learning these things um, with the understanding that we are all part of a really, really racist system. That doesn't mean that there's not hope for us together to dismantle it. It takes us being together in that. And um, and so I know teachers are struggling with what books they can teach, what um, which historical figures they can teach, but they can teach their students that, um, that, that you have a voice and you can find ways to use it and you should be using it. I think we should be listening more to the young people about what they want to learn and what they believe. And, and they really are our only hope of, um, of a future that doesn't look like what we're living today. And so the more we can empower them or encourage them to use their voice, the better off we will all be. I agree 100%. And thank you, Stephanie, for sharing your voice and giving us this sort of definitely a very uplifting message, especially in a time when things are seemingly polarized and people are refusing to listen to each other. I think it's very important to remember that we have to listen to each other and to each other's stories. If people want to learn more about the work you're doing or more about you and your writing, um, how can they get in touch with you? How, where do they find you? Yeah, my um, social media is my name on every social media channel. So just at Stephanie Drinka and my website is stephaniedrinka.com. Not very creative. Um, and then for some of the research and historical work that I've been doing, um, people can visit dallasasianhistory.org and find all of our social media channels there. Can you spell your last name for us? Because I, I don't know that everybody will know Drinka. Sure. It's uh, D as in David, R-E-N-K-A. And also because I talked about the Op-Ed Project, um, their website is theopedproject.org. Okay. Thank you so much. I personally feel very privileged to have had this conversation with you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it so much. Thank you so much. Now, we'd also want to hear from you, our audience, and our valued listeners about any suggestions you might have for guests for the Asian Pacific Voices podcast. 
Also, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and on YouTube. Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers our Asian and Pacific Islander communities with a voice through media arts. And if you would like to support our program, please do. And please visit us at AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. I'm your host, Sasha Fu, and thank you so much for listening. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking episode of Asian Pacific Voices Radio. Until then, take care. <laughs>